Stephen Kocher went missing in 2009 after walking away from his car in a quiet Henderson, Nevada neighborhood. Did he voluntarily walk away from his life? Or did he unknowingly walk straight to his death? This is the cries that bind me. In part one of Stephen Kocher's case, we went over the timeline of events leading up to his disappearance on December 13th, 2009. If you haven't yet listened to part one, I strongly encourage you to start there since it will introduce you to important details we'll be exploring even further today in part two. In the early 2000s, Stephen's landlord, Brett, was volunteering with United Off-Road Rock Crawlers, a company that created the first man-made rock crawling courses for off-road vehicles. Tens of thousands of spectators and hundreds of competitors would drive out to the events that would eventually span across Utah and Nevada. This link between Brett's role as the event's construction manager and Mark, who worked in construction for much of his adult life, doesn't seem like it would be a particularly strong connection. But Mark's hobby of building and operating RC cars would create another possible tie between him and Brett. United Off-Road Rock Crawlers held RC challenges to run alongside their rock crawling competitions. Mark, who poured a lot of his time into building and modifying RC cars, posted pictures and videos of his RC cars across social media. A potential witness who was attending one of the rock crawling competitions in Las Vegas is almost certain he saw Mark at a neighboring RC event, either working the event or participating as a contestant. The event in question was of course arranged by Brett, who hired various construction workers to help set up and tear down each course. With Mark's many years in construction and his obvious passion for RC cars, it wouldn't be that shocking to find out Mark was involved in at least one of Brett's events, either as hired help or an RC contestant. According to many sources, including an ex-girlfriend, Mark had a very troubled past. He had a history of arrests for drug abuse and domestic violence, something many of his girlfriends knew all too well. At one point, his then-girlfriend had experienced enough abuse and violence at the hands of Mark. Paired with his 20-year stint of running from the law, she had finally had enough. Mark was no fan of law enforcement and didn't really try too hard to hide that fact. On December 30th, investigators drove out to the Sun City Anthem neighborhood and began interviewing several of the residents who lived near the cul-de-sac where Stephen parked. While talking with officials, some residents mentioned the strange and suspicious family living at 2260 Evening Light Street. The Sun City Anthem retirement community is pretty upscale. It's not an average Henderson neighborhood. It has multiple security stops along with a very involved neighborhood watch program. Mark and his parents, Severio and Maria, were the only residents in the area who were not part of the neighborhood watch. In fact, a couple residents explained it was a very quiet, safe neighborhood, except for Mark. Mark always had a ton of visitors coming and going, made a lot of noise, and was just an all-around inconsiderate neighbor. When police made their way to 2260 Evening Lights, they got no answer. They looked through the front-facing windows of the home and noticed it was completely vacant, just as one of the neighbors had reported. A tan Honda Accord sat in the driveway, though, which was odd considering the house was empty. When police later ran the license plate number, Severio and Maria, Mark's parents, came back as the registered owners. If they had moved into another home, leaving nothing behind at 2260 evening lights, why was their car parked there weeks later? And if they really were there, why didn't they answer the door? A week later, police went back out to the home in hopes of catching Mark or his parents on the property. Not surprisingly, no one came to the door. After failing to make contact, one detective wrote the following police report, quote, I attempted to contact occupants of 2260 Evening Lights on 10610 and 10810. On 10610, I left a flyer on the front door after receiving no response at the front door. I returned later in the evening and observed the flyer had been removed and still met with negative contact at the front door. A white Dodge van was observed parked in the driveway of the residence bearing Nevada license plate number 937-SSL. This returned to the Severio and Maria DiMaggio at this address. Detective Ridings and I returned on 10810 at approximately 1400 hours and observed the white Dodge van parked in the driveway. 
We met with negative contact at the front door, and I left my business card on the front door requesting contact upon arrival to the residence. I have still not received any telephone calls from this resident, end quote. On January 13th, police tried a different tactic. Instead of going back to 2260 evening lights, they decided to try the condo where Severio and Maria had moved just two and a half miles away. Why it took them so long to visit the new home is unknown, but they were at least able to speak with Mark's dad, Severio. Severio told officers he had no idea who Stephen Kocher was, and he was certain his son wouldn't know him either. He must have sensed how suspicious that sounded, considering dozens of people had been in that tight-knit community for weeks searching for Stephen. Severio backtracked, saying he had seen Stephen on the flyer that was left on his mailbox by volunteers, but never saw anything on the door or around the property of 2260 Evening Lights. As the detectives wrapped up the conversation, they asked Severio to have his son call them as soon as he possibly could, to which Severio agreed. Two more days passed with no word for Mark. Once again, they drove back out to 2260 Evening Lights and knocked on the door. Not surprisingly, no one answered, so they left a business card on the door with a note on the back asking Mark to call them. Mark was proving to be a very difficult man to track down. If his ex-girlfriend was right about him running from the law for over 20 years, the possibility of never being able to speak with Mark was becoming more and more real. Week after week passed with no communication from him. But on February 18th, 2010, Mark finally made contact. An incident report was filed after they spoke with him. The report reads, quote, On 2-18-2010, at approximately 1,500 hours, Detective Writings number 358 and I met with Mark DiMaggio at 2260 Evening Lights in Henderson. I showed DiMaggio several pictures of Stephen Kocher, which I had obtained from his Facebook record. DiMaggio viewed the pictures and stated, I can't say that I've seen him. DiMaggio appeared to be nervous when contacted and while being questioned about Kocher's disappearance. DiMaggio would relax at times while talking about his work project, but then became evasive when asked about where he was currently residing. DiMaggio stated that he uses the casita as his address and will be moving back into it soon. DiMaggio stated that he doesn't tell anyone where he lives. DiMaggio doesn't have any friends in town and does not trust anyone due to the drug lifestyle that people tend to have, end quote. Mark's parents stopped paying their mortgage on the home at 2260 Evening Lights. They all moved out in a matter of hours on December 13th. They knew foreclosure was imminent, yet Mark claimed he continued to use that address. Not only that, he told officers he would be moving back into the casita. Why put so much time and effort into moving out of the home, only to move everything back in so soon after? In the same visit on February 18th, Mark told officers he was a research developer working on a safety feature for bus stops to prevent pedestrians from being hit by other vehicles while they waited for the bus. Even though Mark refused to tell them where he was currently living, he did provide them with a P.O. Box address in Pahrump, Nevada. Officers were suspicious, to say the least. After speaking with them, they called the Nye County Sheriff's Department, which holds jurisdiction over Pahrump. The sheriff's station dropped a bombshell. Mark had four different properties there. But strangely, officials didn't look into the properties that week. They didn't even follow up that month or even that year. On 4-27-2011, Detective Writings and I went to check on four addresses in Pahrump, Nevada, possibly related to this case. 3691 Newberry Avenue, 5360 Lincolnwood, 3720 Park Ridge Avenue, and 2650 Galley Road. The Newberry and Lincolnwood addresses turned out to be vacant lots, wrote one detective. In case you missed it, two of Mark's addresses were vacant lots. No buildings or structures whatsoever. Just completely empty lots, privately owned by Mark. The report goes on to say, On Park Ridge, contact was made with an elderly female who had not seen Kocher after I showed her his photo from the flyer. At the galley address, I made contact with a female who thought that she recognized Kocher from the photo, but could not place where it was that she had seen him. I left a flyer with her and she stated that she would contact me if she saw him again. It took officers 14 months to finally look into Mark's residences in Pahrump, and even then their efforts were minimal at best. They simply drove by each residence. They didn't walk the properties. Even the vacant lots were ignored. If someone was on law enforcement's radar for possible involvement in a missing persons case, don't you think it would be reasonable to at least get out and poke around the empty lots, especially if the owner had a past littered with drug abuse and violence? 
Unfortunately, they never did fully search those properties, and in 2016, a home was built on one of the lots, drastically limiting any future chances of checking underground for anything suspicious. Officers actually missed many opportunities to gather crucial information throughout the investigation. In fact, when he was first reported missing, some officers shared that the investigation wasn't really that important. Stephen was a 30-year-old man with a missing passport. Chances were he simply wanted to walk away and be left alone. On Tuesday, December 15th, two days after Stephen was captured on camera walking down Evening Light Street, the neighborhood HOA board noticed his car still hadn't moved from the cul-de-sac. Stephen had flyers from the window washing company sitting in his front seat, so a member from the HOA called the number listed. Travis, who was Stephen's boss and the owner of the company, answered the call and gave them Stephen's cell phone number. They called Stephen's phone but got no answer, so they left a voicemail asking him to call them back about his parked car. When they still hadn't heard from Stephen the next day, they were able to get Deanne's phone number, but she didn't answer when they called either. They left her a voicemail asking if she'd like to come and get Stephen's car, which seemed to be abandoned there. Deanne didn't see the message until the next day, Thursday, December 17th. After listening to the voicemail, she called some of their family members to see if anyone had heard from Stephen, which no one had. She reported him missing that same day. Over the next week, Stephen's family started their own investigation. They called jails, hospitals, and even morgues, but came up empty-handed each time. With authorities seemingly dragging their feet, the coachers became even more proactive in their search. After being alerted about Stephen's car, Rolf took Dallin and Stephen's uncle out to where Stephen's Chevy Cavalier was left. As they pulled up, they were surprised to see how Stephen had parked his car. Instead of pulling up adjacent to the curb, he simply left his car in the very center of the cul-de-sac several feet from the curb. Rolf pulled out a spare key to the car and found a pillow, blankets, and a shaving kit inside, suggesting he was sleeping in his car before he went missing. One of Stephen's cousins would actually later share that it wasn't unusual for Stephen to sleep in his car if he was traveling alone. In the back seat was a Kmart shopping bag with the gifts he had purchased on December 12th. A large frozen lasagna was also in the back seat, which had obviously thawed and gone bad by the time the coacher searched his car. His stop in Sun City Anthem had to have been planned as a short visit. Why else would he purchase a large lasagna just to let it go to waste sitting in his car? As confusing and frightening as the entire situation was soon becoming, Rolf's heart broke when he found a stack of Stephen's resumes in the trunk of his car. Stephen was truly putting his all into finding a job. Meanwhile, his room in St. George was searched and produced his guitar, computer, cell phone charger, unsent job applications, and recently purchased groceries. No one was able to find Stephen's passport, leaving them all to wonder if Stephen really had decided to run off. They weren't the only ones considering the idea of Stephen walking away. The search for Susan Powell slipped into a family feud today. On December 6, 2009, exactly one week before Stephen was last seen, a young mom from West Valley City, Utah, went missing. When Susan Powell didn't drop her two sons off at daycare or show up for work on Monday, December 7th, her family knew something had happened. Her husband, Josh, got home later that day with their two sons. He told police he had taken his boys on a spur-of-the-moment overnight camping trip. Weather was recorded that day with snow and a high of 25 degrees Fahrenheit at noon, with temps falling below 16 degrees at night. Not ideal for camping, especially with very little planning and two young children. Although there were a ton of signs pointing to Josh and even his father, Steve Powell, being responsible for Susan's disappearance, there was never enough solid evidence for prosecutors to arrest Josh or his dad. Steve Powell had an obvious obsession with his daughter-in-law, Susan. He collected photos of her and wrote extensive journal entries detailing how truly sick his obsession was. In 2012, a few years after Susan disappeared, he would be arrested for voyeurism and child pornography. But back to early 2010, the Powell family announced their suspicions of Susan Powell and Stephen Kocher having a secret love affair. They proposed the idea that the two ran away together, probably to Brazil since Stephen was familiar with the country and language from his mission work there years before. There was never any evidence to back up their wild accusations. Everyone chalked it up to the Powells trying to take the heat off of themselves for Susan's disappearance. But I think I need help right away. This could be life-threatening, and I'm, a, I'm afraid for their lives. On February 5, 2012, a social worker was bringing Josh's two sons over to his house for a supervised visit. 
Josh had lost custody of his kids in September of 2011, so all visits were supervised with a licensed social worker. When Josh answered the door that morning, he grabbed his sons and pulled them inside as he pushed the social worker out of the doorway, locking the door behind her. She immediately called 911 to report what was going on, but as she was speaking with dispatchers, Josh's house exploded and burst into flames. He blew up the house and the kids! Josh had taken his own life, trapping his young boys with him. Charlie and Brayden were murdered by their father. They were only five and seven years old. For what it's worth, even today, there has never been any evidence that linked Stephen with Susan. Back in St. George, more searches of Stephen's bedroom were done with the hopes of finding clues or signs that they may have initially missed. As Rolf combed through Stephen's belongings, he dug around in a clothes drawer and he was shocked when he pulled out Stephen's passport from the bottom. The investigation would finally be taken seriously. Airlines and bus stations were checked, but there were no records of Stephen, or anyone resembling him, traveling via plane or bus. Since law enforcement seemed uninterested in Stephen's case, they never went out to search his car while it was parked in Sun City Anthem. Left with no other choice, Stephen's family had to drive his car back to their house in Bountiful, Utah. Wanting to explore all avenues, they called in drug-sniffing dogs to examine Steve's car. They weren't able to find any evidence of drugs in the vehicle, but it's also important to note the dogs were not trained to locate pills. On December 24th, the first news story about Stephen's disappearance was published. His old employer, the Salt Lake Tribune, released an article titled, Ex-Tribune Employee Reported Missing. On December 30th, officials finally made their way to the Sun City Anthem neighborhood. Helicopters, all-terrain vehicles, and search dogs were all brought along to canvas the neighborhood and the surrounding desert. The next day, a second search was underway while other law enforcement officers began passing out flyers and going door-to-door, asking residents if they knew anything about Stephen's disappearance. Search efforts continued over the next few days, resulting in new leads coming through. One tip reported seeing a man who could be Stephen eating at a Las Vegas IHOP. Some of Stephen's immediate and extended family drove out to that IHOP and ate there several days in a row, hoping to be there at the same time as the mystery man. The family would find out shortly after that the man frequenting the IHOP was not Stephen. The vice president of Anderson Dairy was good friends with one of Stephen's cousins and offered to print Stephen's information on all of their milk cartons, something that hadn't really been done since the 1990s. But even with this picture circulating on all Anderson Dairy milk cartons, no solid leads came in. Investigators continued their search into Stephen's disappearance, checking nearby deserts and even underground tunnels within Anthem. As with any case, leads were coming in that they had to rule out or look into further. One detective's report stated, quote, On 4-14-2010, I received a call from Angela, who wished to remain anonymous, concerning a possible location for Stephen Kocher. Angela stated that a friend of hers had seen Stephen in the area of Las Vegas Boulevard, south of St. Rose Parkway. Angela stated that it was near the old auto auction place and near some heavy equipment and trees. Stephen had bragged about being the guy from the milk carton. Anderson Dairy produced this in February. Stephen was driving a maroon-colored Ford 90s model F-150 extended cab pickup truck with unknown license plates. Stephen was described as clean-cut, with shorter hair than on the milk carton picture. A few weeks ago, Stephen stated that he was going to Big Bear, California for a barbecue but would be returning. I had Angela go on the Facebook website, Help Us Find Stephen Kocher, and view the photos to see if her friend recognized them. Angela stated that she was positive that the person she knows as Steve is the same as the photos on this website. Angela stated that Stephen also has many friends that live in Sandy Valley. Detective Writings and I went to this area and attempted to locate Kocher or his vehicle, but had no luck. End quote. They spoke with Angela several more times. Each time, she would send police in a different direction, insisting it really was Stephen Kocher she and her friends were seeing, but officials continually hit a dead end. Although they never confirmed Angela's true identity, she always used the same name, Angela DiMaggio, the same last name as Mark. There had been no public information on Mark or his possible involvement with the case, which makes Angela's last name that much more eerie. Whether she really was related to Mark or was using a completely fabricated name has yet to be determined. Angela wasn't the only one to reach out to police with stories of seeing Stephen. In early January 2010, someone believed they saw Stephen getting on the 105 bus on MLK Boulevard and Craig Road sometime on January 6th. 
On February 7th of the same year, a retired member of law enforcement named John Rigg reported he believed he interacted with Stephen in the parking lot of a Best Buy in Las Vegas on Super Bowl Sunday. The stranger approached John and explained he needed to get back home to Utah but didn't have enough money to buy a ticket. John generously gave the man $40 and began walking to the entrance of the store. The stranger from the parking lot caught up to him and asked why he decided to give him money. The police report states, quote, Rigg told him that he wanted to help him out and only asked that someday he return the favor to someone else in the future that might need help. Rigg stated that the subject was alone and was somewhat clean other than unshaven for a few days. The subject also seemed to be well-spoken, polite, and intelligent. Rigg later saw the story about Coacher being missing and found his photo on the internet. Rigg, a retired law enforcement member, was very sure that the person he saw at Best Buy was Coacher. Rigg stated that the only difference was that the subject had longer hair than Coacher's photo, end quote. The detective followed up by interviewing several of the Best Buy employees, but no one could remember seeing anyone who looked like Stephen. He reviewed the surveillance footage but couldn't pick out anyone he thought could be Stephen, but he also stated the video footage was of poor quality and grainy. Three days later, another sighting of Stephen on Craig Road at a Home Depot was reported. That lead produced no results. Several more tips would come in, but each ended at a dead end. A couple more searches were held over the next few months, but by May 2010, there had been no movement. Aside from Stephen's family, no one was out searching anymore. Stephen hadn't been featured on any news channels or articles. Finally, in July of 2010, a new search party was formed to search homeless shelters and bus routes. The one tip they received didn't produce any results. The search was called off on the second day. Months of more silence ended in December of 2010. News outlets were finally talking about Stephen again. It was already the one-year anniversary of his disappearance. It seemed as if Stephen's case had quickly turned cold. With no leads to investigate, officials were at a standstill. With nothing else to go off of, the community started to consider even more scenarios to explain the reasoning behind Stephen's road trips and why he ended up in the Las Vegas area. While some do have merit, others were either debunked right away or were just so out there they don't make sense, even if he was acting completely differently before he left. Was Stephen gay and just too ashamed to come out because of his deeply religious values? A few people have spoken out online, offering that as an explanation. If Stephen had fallen in love with a man, maybe he felt the only way he could openly and comfortably be with him was to get away from family, friends, his church basically anything or anyone that could be tied back to him. But Stephen drove into a retirement community. Of course it's possible for two people to have a considerate age gap. Stephen was a grown adult at 30 years old, so being with someone who was 55 or older wouldn't be that unheard of. But even so, why would he leave his car in such an obvious place? Stereotypically speaking, retired folks have a lot of time on their hands, and senior citizens can be known for being very observant and curious. There's no way Stephen parked his car in an open cul-de-sac in a 55-plus community before running off with someone. It would be noticed right away, especially since it was so out of place. If he truly wanted to run away, whether to escape his past life or to be with another person, it would make more sense to leave his car in a heavily trafficked area. Las Vegas has 175 casinos throughout the city, and that doesn't even count smaller casinos surrounding the area. Some gamblers will stay at casinos for days or even weeks at a time. Leaving a car in a casino parking lot definitely wouldn't raise any flags or grab anyone's attention. It could be weeks and weeks before anyone noticed the car hadn't moved. And if Stephen didn't want to leave it at a casino? What about the several neighborhoods within that area that had a reputation for being unsafe? An abandoned car probably wouldn't stay abandoned for very long. But truly, Stephen choosing to leave or run away on his own accord is just a hard idea to accept. Even if Stephen was gay, which is extremely far-fetched, his family, as devout as they were, loved Stephen unconditionally. They've made it clear that they would love and accept him no matter what. Alternatively, Mark's parents had recently left their three-bedroom home on evening lights for not paying their mortgage. They knew they'd be foreclosed on in a matter of time. Would that give Stephen a reason to be walking towards their home? If he was in the area serving foreclosure notices, it would give him a reason to be in that neighborhood. 
but an individual needs to be licensed in order to serve any sort of foreclosure notices in Nevada. Even if Stephen was able to somehow serve foreclosure notices without a license, Mark's parents had only recently stopped paying their mortgage. They wouldn't be foreclosed on so soon or within the time period Stephen was traveling throughout Nevada. There is another scenario put together based on camera footage that suggests Stephen was going to 2260 Evening Lights. Stephen knocked on someone's door in Sun City Anthem and asked the man if he wanted money. The house was on Savannah Springs Road, the second house from the corner that intersects with Evening Lights. A few seconds later, he is seen on surveillance cameras that were on the corner house. The evening light side of the house had an additional camera that captured Stephen walking onto evening lights from Savannah Springs. He crosses over to the opposite side of evening lights, which have even-numbered addresses, and walks barely out of view of the camera, right as he reaches 2260, Mark's house. Some people who have studied the surveillance footage have pointed out movement in front of Stephen's reflection as he's walking down evening lights. Some say it looks like a van pulling into Mark's driveway. Others think it looks like a gate or door of some kind is opening right as Stephen approaches. The possible movement seen on camera have never been confirmed, but it does make his final moments on camera that much more haunting. Was Stephen instructed to go to, quote, the second house from the corner, but initially have the wrong street? It could explain why he parked his car in the cul-de-sac. It was easier to pull onto Savannah Springs Road, drive past the house to the cul-de-sac where he could easily make a U-turn to face the house in question. Considering he arrived a few minutes before noon, it would make sense that he'd spend a few extra seconds to park his car in the direction where he'd be leaving. Longer clips of the surveillance footage that captured Stephen's last movements also show a suspicious car driving past the camera just moments after Stephen did. The timing of the SUV pulling into view and waiting right where Stephen would be walking was ringing a lot of alarm bells. After investigating, though, it was discovered the driver of the SUV was a local real estate agent, but that didn't really put anyone at ease. Authorities spoke to the woman and confirmed she was waiting on Savannah Springs Road for her mother, who lived on the street. The two women went out to lunch and returned to the home in Sun City Anthem a couple hours later. Officials who have seen the entire video reported the mother and daughter were captured on the security cameras as they arrived back to the residence, just as the driver had said. To be 30 years old in the LDS church and not be married is pretty uncommon. Generally speaking, most members are married and have started families even by their mid-twenties. I'm sure Stephen felt immense pressure, watching his peers and siblings find spouses and begin having babies when he wasn't even in a relationship. While there were one or two serious girlfriends in his past, he never could take the next step in proposing, feeling the girl's faith or interest in the church wasn't as serious as his own. Topped with being unable to find reliable income, Stephen was worried he wouldn't be able to support a family the way he wanted. The pressure, and failure, was undoubtedly weighing on him. Even so, the bishop of Stephen's church promised he'd help him nail down a job by January. They all just needed to make it through the Christmas season, and then all hands on deck would be dedicated to helping Stephen. Was Stephen not able to wait those few more weeks? If he was feeling all the pressure and stress and finally hit his breaking point, It could suggest he simply drove to a random neighborhood, parked, and walked into the surrounding desert, never to be seen again. But if that's the case, how did he find that very specific cul-de-sac? The neighborhood is not easy to navigate by any means, especially for someone who's never even been there. And why that patch of desert? There were a ton of stretches of desert he could have chosen to disappear in. Why one so close to a heavily populated neighborhood? There are so many questions that have yet to be answered. Why was Mark's casita trashed when authorities searched it? There were suspicious, large holes in the walls. The side of the bathtub had been kicked in. Did Mark trash it during a drug-fueled rage? Was he pissed he was getting evicted? Or did a full-blown brawl play out in the house, resulting in the doors and walls being broken and kicked in? Why did Brett tell authorities the neighbor across the street from Stephen talked to him the night before he went missing? Brett claimed John, who lived across the street of the St. George house, spoke with Stephen when he pulled up to the house at 10 o'clock the night of December 12th. Stephen, who was usually quiet and withdrawn, didn't have a history of interacting with neighbors or even really acknowledging them in the months that he lived there. He would always pull into the driveway and walk straight into the house, never really even looking up to notice if anyone was around. Yet, the night before he went missing, he was standing outside talking to his neighbor for the first time 
telling him all about his trip to Las Vegas the next day. When investigators were able to talk to John themselves to hear his version of events, he told them he did see Stephen pull up to the house that night, but he absolutely did not have any sort of conversation with him. The two didn't even wave to each other. Why would Brett fabricate such a specific lie? And why did he repeatedly call Stephen's cell between December 13th and 16th? Was he concerned his tenant was running out on him? Or was he desperately trying to check the status of that errand he sent him on? And lastly, why did initial police reports state Stephen's phone was used on December 14th, the day after he was last seen, to call his voicemail? Reports were later released to the public with Stephen's cell phone records. Stephen's phone didn't dial his voicemail that morning. It called a completely different number. The call lasted 10 seconds but wasn't recorded to any cell tower. The phone company would later explain there was a computer glitch that failed to capture the coordinates of that last phone call. Who was the owner of that other phone number? Did they have any connection to Stephen? Or did someone take Stephen's phone after Stephen was gone? In February of 2011, Rolf Kocher was rushed to the hospital. Staff believed he may be fighting some sort of bacterial infection, possibly caused by toxic shock syndrome. Devastatingly, he passed away on February 10, 2011, at the age of 61, 424 days after his son's disappearance. In the 14 months that passed after Stephen vanished, Rolf spent each moment searching for him, determined to bring Stephen home. He was buried without ever finding out what happened. Stephen was 5'11 and weighed approximately 180 pounds around the time of his disappearance. He has a fair complexion with blonde hair and blue eyes. His hair can sometimes look sandy or even strawberry blonde. He has two surgical scars behind each ear and several birthmarks on his abdomen that form a shape similar to the Nike swoosh symbol. Stephen's family relies on their unwavering faith to get them through the difficult time of the unknowing. Whether they see Stephen again in this lifetime or have to wait until the afterlife, they're certain their God is watching over him until the time comes they can all be reunited. As we close on the episode, I'd like to leave you with the song Stephen wrote and performed called Felt Like This. It's been ten days It's never gone away I don't want to hurt you I just can't see this ending well It's gone to space And fell from the highest star I don't want to hurt you But this is way, way, way too far And I've never felt like this before And I'm still here on the floor I know you left me wasting away But I keep hoping for a better day It's been two years I'm still laying here I can't tell you It was the right thing to do I had to feel right I had to make a choice what I had to do and I've never felt like this before like the weight of the world was on the front door I didn't know how to act didn't know how to think better 
if you have any information related to the disappearance of Stephen Kocher, please contact the Henderson Police Department at 702-267-5000. Additional contact numbers can be found in the show notes. For more information on this case, please visit thecriesthatbindme.com.